when Christians choose flesh over Christ. Crucifying your flesh is difficult. What do we mean by that? It means giving up things that you might enjoy, things that you might like, but are not good for you and that are separating you from full relationship with God. So when we say crucify your flesh, we are saying to within your heart, be willing to let go of whatever it is. And sometimes it could be relationships and people, whatever it is that you know is not good for you and is not supporting your relationship with God. Those are the things that Jesus said that we need to put on the cross in order to follow him. So Luke 9.23 and the New Century Version of the Bible says, Jesus said to all of them, if people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing to give up their lives daily to follow me. In that scripture, Jesus tells his disciples to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow him. Jesus called those who wish to be his disciples to discipline themselves in their everyday life by living in a way that is honoring to him and to others. So what does that mean, to live a life that is honoring to God and to the people that we are called to serve? Anything that puts you in bondage does not honor God. If it makes you feel guilty, if you have to hide it or justify it, then that is not of God. And that is not something you should be doing anyway. So it should be easy for you to let it go. But that's not how sin works. That's not how the devil works. Oh, the things we like are very pleasing to us. So that makes it a sacrifice to let it go. So what Jesus is saying is that you're going to have to make some sacrifices in order to follow me. See, our lives are built on the, the thinking of this world, the materials and the resources of this world. So the majority of what we do, think, say, buy, consume are not things that are suitable for people of God who truly want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you continue in that thing that you like, let's call it sin or not call it sin. People don't like the word sin, but that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you continue in that thing and say, well, I just can't give this up. So God is just going to have to forgive me and roll with it. Oh, <laughs> really? Then are you calling God a liar? Are you saying that the power of Christ, the anointed one is not enough to free you of this thing? How deep is your love? Are you saying that you are not willing to give it all up in order to follow Christ? Because that is the requirement. So the situation that I alluded to in the title of this message, Pastor Dwayne Dawkins, or former Pastor Dwayne Dawkins, was leading a church and was caught in a gay sex situation on video with a young man through OnlyFans, okay? So he's married with two or three children. He admitted that this is, a not, this is not the first time that he had been caught in some same-sex activity because he struggles with it. When he got married to his wife, he did not disclose to her that he did gay things and that he struggled with that lifestyle. So once he got married... He slipped into some stuff, not once, probably not even twice. This is just what we know very publicly because of the very public way that it was exposed. So recently he got on a panel with other Christians who had fallen and were talking about their scandals, the things that they were exposed for. He basically matter of factly admitted to all of this that I have just said and that he continues to struggle with it. And people applauded him. There's a problem with that, right? In the pulpit, he spoke against homosexuality. He had fiery words of hell and damnation to speak over people dealing with homosexuality when he himself 
has been struggling with the same thing. So now you're being hypocritical. Wouldn't it be better to not say anything about that since that is your struggle and you are still participating in it on the low? Why would you get in a pulpit and start talking about matters of sex and sexuality anyway? That's not what a broad general audience needs to hear from the pulpit anyway. So nevertheless, he admitted to all of this. But the gist that I got from how he said it and the way he said it is that this is his thing is out. Everybody knows about it. His wife, his kids, everybody knows about this now. So now he can be free to continue in it. You have to crucify your flesh. So now this is not even a sexual preference issue. This is a relationship with God issue. If you say you are a true follower of Christ, he said all of that stuff that you like to do. You got to nail that to the cross. Carry it with you on a daily basis, meaning that you might still have the desire. That's why you got to carry your cross. He said you got to take up your cross on a daily basis because it doesn't mean that those desires are just going to go away so that you'll have no other problem with it. He's saying that on a daily basis, you have to love Christ so much that you are willing to give up this thing you really want to do, that you're tempted to, that pleases you. You are willing to give that up on a daily basis in order to follow Christ and be in good standing with God. So I don't care what it is. I don't care if the gay stuff is not even an issue. Obedience is the issue. And so people applauding him, saying that he's struggling and and blah, 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 blah. Basically, it sounded like he was coming out. All right. okay, do that if you want to. But now when you say you are a Christian, you have to obey the word of the Lord. You have to obey and live a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. And that is not pleasing to God. The hiding, the lying, the guilt the shame, the exposure. That's the devil stuff. That's what the enemy does. That's not of light. That is not of God. So that's why he wants you to nail it to the cross so that you can be victorious in your life and be in full relationship with God without any sort of condemnation. And also so that you will not keep giving ground to Satan to influence your life. When you continue in sinful activity that you like, but that you know is wrong, but that is hard for you to let go, you open the door to satanic activity. And now that separates you from God until you deal with it, until you get delivered from it. It compromises your relationship with God. So yes, God loves you. Jesus loves you, but you still got this stuff that you need to be willing to clear out in order to follow Christ. Salvation is free. Yes, you can believe in Christ and come to the Lord, but being with Christ, being in relationship with Christ and entering into the kingdom of heaven, following the narrow way, the narrow path requires us to sacrifice that feel good stuff you like to do, but that's not good for you. That stuff you like to watch, the things you like to consume. So can you handle that? He said, you have to take up your cross daily to follow him. You have to crucify your flesh. Are you willing to do that? Because this is the requirement to follow Christ. This is how people can tell that you are different. You live a different lifestyle. This is the cross for us. Is it easy? No. This is why people leave Christianity for other less demanding spiritual practices because, oh, Christians can't have fun. You can't be free. You just can't be who you are when you're a Christian. Oh, disciplining your flesh is a struggle at first because you really don't want to let go of those things that you like. That's the struggle. You want to keep that and still be in relationship with God. But he's telling you, you got to let go of that if you really want to come to me. This is why people fast from food and from social media, things of that nature, to gain the strength and the mental fortitude to follow the Lord and to release the things that are not good for them. So Jesus sent you a helper. He sent us the Holy Spirit. We have help 
to let these things go. We don't have to just go cold turkey or try to do it on our own, but we have to be willing to let that go. We have to willingly come to the altar in prayer and say, God, I really like this. I struggle with this. I want to keep this. I don't want to let it go. You are going to have to help me to release this so that I can be fully in relationship and right standing with you. So some of you might be thinking, oh, I, I don't have all of that going on. You know, I'm not really struggling with all of that because you think it's big things like that. It's big sins like that. Because some people categorize big sins and little sins. Things that, oh, it's not that bad. And, ooh, that's really bad. <laughs> but what does sin do, big or small? It separates you from God. It compromises your relationship. So all of it is bad. None of it is good. So I will just say with me personally, I have laid so much on the altar that sometimes it makes me angry. <laughs> oh, I have arguments with God. I gave up my dreams and ideas of what my life should look like. Marriage, children, doctoral degree, career, laid it all on the line in order to follow you. And I still have not seen the big reward that other people say they get when they do less. It's like they give up less and get more quicker than I have. That's how you know you are crucifying some flesh right there. When you start getting upset, listen, this person is successful and they're not even as disciplined as you're making me be. Why are you forcing me to be this disciplined before I get my big promised land blessings? But these people are not and they are all up in their promised land making laps, just making laps in their promised land. <laughs> what is happening? Yes, that's what sacrifice sounds like. That's what crucifying your flesh sounds like. <laughs> so on top of that, because I'm still struggling to pay rent, I'm just going to keep it all the way 100. I'm still struggling to pay rent. And what has come to me is those Cheetos, all that cheese and dairy that you eat, those cookies, those chips, those chocolate covered cashews. You got to leave that alone. What? Those honey Dijon kettle crunch chips that you like. Oh, yeah. you. Those entire frozen pieces that you eat at certain times of the month. All of that potato soup with the salt in it. Yeah, that stuff. Oh, you're going to have to let that go, dear. I need you to be healthy. And you know that sugar causes your blood pressure to go up. Sugar causes blockage of arteries. You consume way too much sugar. So I need you to scale down on that and let that stuff go. And I almost had a fit. Oh my goodness. So now I have no sweetness in my life and you want me to give up the stuff I like to eat? You want me to give up more on top of what I have already sacrificed? You want me to give up the last remaining things? I, got, I ain't got no man. Lord, where the man at then? Where is all my money? Where, where is that? I'm celibate and don't want to be all of this. And now you wanted me to give up the stuff I like to eat? <laughs> this is what crucifying your flesh sounds like. That's what it feels like. Now, all of that stuff is bad for me. I, but see, I had already given up ice cream. I used to eat so much ice cream, like maybe a gallon a week. Got to the point where my skin is all broken out. You know, I've had a rash for I don't know how long because I was not willing to give up the ice cream. It kept coming to me. Listen, you got to stop all of this cow milk ice cream. You got to stop that. You really just have to let it go. It was so good. Strawberry cheesecake ice cream, the Ben and Jerry's. Uh -uh, I just kept eating it and eating it. And this was over a period of years. So I recently did cut that out. Now it's like, you want me to cut the non-dairy sweet treats that I like to? Come on, Lord. Why don't you like me? Then I'm mad again. Where is all of my stuff then? 
Where is all my money? Where's all my riches? Where is my fame? Where is all of my stuff? That is what it feels like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, to crucify your flesh. What am I going to get for all of this? Am I going to be healed? Am I going to be famous and wealthy? Now, this is how we begin to think in our brains. If I let all of this go, what is God going to replace it with? Because in our selfishness, this is how we think. Shouldn't it be, I gladly give up these things in order to obey the Lord because he knows what is good for me. God wants the best for me. So if he's asking me to release these things, it must be for my good. That's how we should think about it. But no, we think about it in a very self-centered manner. Okay, if I give you this, what you going to give me back? If I give you this, okay, what do I get back? And it doesn't always look like that. It doesn't always work that way. So that is a very transactional relationship with the Lord. So it may take, in my case, this has been years, years, years that I have been waiting for some things that I have prayed for. And so I am still having to sacrifice more and more and more. And I still have not seen the manifestation or the reward, the recompense that I've been expecting. Will it come? Didn't his word say, if you do this, I will do this for you? So it may be a matter of time before you see the reward you are expecting for the sacrifices that you are making now. How about the reward is better health? How about you won't fall out and have a heart attack? Ashawn, how about that? <laughs> that's, that's good, right? Right. That is a good thing. Good health is a gift. So that should, I should see that as a very good reward for the sacrifice of me giving up all of this junk food, the stuff that I really, really like to eat. Because why? Because I ain't got no man yet. <laughs> so I need to have something pleasing, right, women? Yes, these are the arguments that we have with God a lot. So this is called the pruning process. Why doesn't God want me to have any pleasures in my life? It's not that. You are being pruned for service to God. You said, I will follow you, Lord. I will do what you want me to do. And he said, okay, great. Now, in order for me to get you to the point where you can best do that, I am going to have to strip you of some of this stuff that you picked up in the world that's not going to work in the kingdom of God. So you were working in Satan's kingdom, right? This world system. Now you are a part of a new system. And to be part of this new system, I need you to let go of these things. It is like a, a florist taking thorns off of rose stems. They have a slicer that they use to get those thorns off. Now, a very skilled florist know how to dethorn those stems without ripping it so that the flowers will last longer. God is our husbandman. He is a very skilled pruner. So although we feel it, Although it hurts, we are going to not utterly be destroyed. We are going to heal very quickly and be stronger than ever. That is what happens when you crucify your flesh, when you submit to this pruning process. He is trying to get us to be more powerful and stronger and more effective in winning souls for Christ. That's what all of this is about. So I was having all of these arguments with God and in, with, in his favor, he led me to receive two words from people I did not know, two prophetic words that really confirmed for me what I already felt like he was telling me. But then I was getting so upset, you know, because the time has been so long. I was like, oh, that must not have been God talking to me. So I'm getting ready to do this. So before I went out and to do that, what I was getting ready to do, it's like, hey, the Lord is saying da, 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 da. And that's exactly what I need to hear. Has that made this process easier for me? Nope. <laughs> But it helps me to stay obedient. 
and helps me not to move out of bounds or out of the will of God. I don't have to like it. I just have to keep submitting to it. So, okay, you've given up there. You've given up all your plans and purposes for your life. You've given up all this stuff. Well, you might as well go all the way in, Ashawn, and just give up these chocolate-covered cashews. Then, Then what is this? If you say you have given up all of this stuff, then why not give up the chips too? You might as well go all the way in, darling. You might as well go all the way in. Same thing with you. If you have come this far, so far that you cannot turn around, you might as well keep going to see what's on the other side. What does God have in store for you? It has to be good because Jeremiah 29 and 11 says that God has good plans for us to give us a hope and a future, not plans to hurt us. So you might as well go all the way in to see the good blessings that God will release to you. To whom much is given, much is required. So we develop in the spirit faster than we see it manifesting in our lives. Do you understand that? So There is so much happening on my behalf in the spirit that I don't see right now in my everyday life. My rent is due right now. I do not see my wealth and riches of money right now. (laughs) Because my question then was, where is all my stuff, right? There is an appointed time for all of that stuff that I've been looking for to be released. So Luke 4... So Luke chapter 12, verse 48 reads, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. If you are like me and you feel like you have had to give up so much and why, It is because God has already trusted you with so much territory, so many resources, so many people, because he has given you so much influence. That is already done. That is already so in the spirit. But there is a perfect time that he will release that to us so that we see it in our physical lives. And that is what gives me hope. Listen, God is not going to have you do all of this for nothing, right? What kind of God would he be if he had me to go all of this way, give up all of these things, crucify all of this flesh, and have it be for nothing? That's not even what the Bible says, right? He has just positioned me to receive even more promises than I thought I was going to get. Come on now. He is positioning me for the exceedingly and abundantly. So when you give it up, when you crucify your flesh, that signifies that God is expanding your capacity to receive more than you thought. So that is why I am on the third day of not eating cookies, Cheetos, cashews, (laughs) that stuff that I like to eat. That is the hope that I have. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 through 25. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. The King James Version says lust. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their own sinful selves. They have given up their old selfish feelings and the evil things they wanted to do. We get our new life from the Spirit, so we should follow the Spirit. You belong to Christ when you give up that sinful stuff that's not good for you anyway. So back to the situation regarding this pastor gentleman. He gave in to his desires. And people supported him. They clapped for him. They were like, oh, you're struggling. Oh, you know, well, God bless you. God's going to do this. Mm -hmm. You have to tell that man he's got to crucify his flesh, right? So if this is the thing that he really likes, you're going to have to put that on the cross. You got to nail that to the cross. That's what the Bible says. You got to nail that to the cross. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Women are told that we have to be celibate that we can't be out here fornicating, 
that we have to let go of the ding dongs, whether that's, you know, the hostess cupcake ding dong or the other kind of ding dong. Yeah, I said it. You got to nail that to the cross too. So that goes for all of us. Gender is not an issue. (laughs) This man in the last report that I have seen moved to Atlanta, the black gay capital of the world. You talk about feeding your temptation. Are you kidding me? You So you're no longer struggling with this. You have decided this is how you want to live. And once you make that decision, then God is going to have to allow you to do what you want to do and to suffer the consequences of it. Allegedly, his wife and kids are there with him in his struggling. He moved in Temptation City where he is not going to be able to avoid that thing that he likes. He is supported by so many people around him who also like that thing that he likes, who are willing to show him where you can get that thing that they like. (laughs) Oh, that's trouble. You have made a decision and God is going to have to allow you to abide by your decision. You know, the old church folks call that a reprobate mind, meaning that you have resisted God so much that he's just going to have to let you go, let you do your thing and see what happens to you. That is a dangerous space to be in. People often use Paul as an example of always struggling with something, basically until your last breath, that there are some things that you might never get delivered from or healed from in this lifetime. Some people think being same-sex attracted is their thorn in the flesh, like Paul had a thorn in his flesh that they would never be able to change. So is this the case? Is anything too hard for God? So let's look at Paul's rationale for why this thing he couldn't shake entered his life. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, here is the background. Paul had received such great revelation from God. He had been taken up through all the heavens, basically. He had visions and received information that no other person really has. He said, it's so good, y'all. I could boast about it. Oh, he could. He could sell holy water. He could sell his clothes. I mean, he could make a whole business off of the stuff that God showed him. He could really boast about that. And so God knows this, knew this about Paul. You know, Paul's history, he was Saul killing Christians and all of that, a Pharisee. So he knows Paul's personality. So he says, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Number one, what should hit you is God is over every created being, over Satan, over the demons, over the spirits. God uses satanic influences to get some things done. Sometimes the people of God uh, don't know that fat meat is greasy, so he's got to use Satan's forces. You know, you ain't going to kill them like Job, but I need you to shake them up. So God is over us all. That should give you some comfort, and then it might, should scare some of you. (laughs) All right. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This thing that buffeted Paul kept him close to God. He had to continually pray for strength to follow God and to endure this thing every day of his life. When Paul understood that this thing was from the God who loved him, Paul got happy because he knew this thing would not overtake him. By God's strength, not Paul's own strength, he was able to run his race even with this thing attached to him. So this thing he couldn't shake, this spirit that had come upon him, he had to put that on the cross, pick it up daily, and keep following the Lord. 
So this is why you need to introduce your kids to a Christian lifestyle as babies. In the first Matrix movie, Morpheus told Neo that they usually do not release a mind beyond a, a certain age or past a certain age into adulthood because it was subject to break. So Neo had technically reached the age past which they should have been renewing his mind, but they realized Morpheus believed he was strong enough to take it without breaking. Basically, Paul got happy because he realized God had faith in him, trusted Paul that he could take this thing without it breaking him. My God. And that's why God, that's why Paul got happy when God has faith in you. He's like, "Uh oh, I know this is tough, but you're going to win. I know you're going to get victory over this. Some people may have fallen by the wayside. Some people may not have made it, but I know you're going to make it. So you you can take this. I got you. My grace is sufficient for you. The longer you live without God in the world, the harder it is to follow Christ. Maybe you acknowledge God but you still do your own thing. You might be a carnal Christian, meaning you say you believe in Christ, you go to church, you love the Lord, but you are still out here doing raggedy stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. You are up in the clubs with your boobs out. Maybe you're on Instagram showing a little this, showing a little that. You're boozing it up, sniffing a little bit, shooting a little bit, because you know what? We all sin, you know, and nobody's ever going to be perfect. So, you know, this is just my thing. The longer you keep doing that, the harder it is to discipline your flesh. Luckily, we have the help of the Holy Spirit and we must pray every day and call upon him every day. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Hebrews 10 and 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Here's another version. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. That's the New Living Translation. Now, in this example, if this pastor who is now in Atlanta has another same-sex moment with another young boy, he is married, he's got kids, he says he is a man of God, you know what's what, you know right from wrong. When you accepted a call or when you put yourself up there as a pastor or teacher of the word of God, then you knew you were going to be judged more harshly. You know all of this. If you still keep doing it, grace is going to run out. God's grace runs out. When you know the right thing to do and you do the opposite, you will be exposed and will have to suffer the consequences of your choices in this world and in eternity. This is a scary and dangerous situation to be in. When God uncovers you, that means he has honored your decision to leave the narrow path that leads to the kingdom of heaven. The scariest thing is you might not even notice. You might still have all of the things in your life that make you successful, that make you happy, but the spirit of God has left you. There are plenty of people in pulpits who are still preaching when God took his anointing from them. And you can tell, people can tell. And so then people start making fun of them, ridiculing them, uh, scoffing at them, making a mockery of them. And then others say, oh, well, you need to leave God's people alone. Well, God's people need to get right, get back in relationship with the Lord. When Saul kept being disobedient, he was no longer king and David became his replacement. Saul did not realize these things automatically. He got rebuked by the prophet Samuel. So he knew that God was mad at him. He knew that God felt like he had been disobedient. These are the things that Saul knew. But he was still a child of God. You know, he apologized. Okay, so are we good? And Samuel was like, no, we're not good. He was like, oh, okay, sorry. He kept being disobedient. And so the Lord released evil spirits to torment Saul because that is the consequence of disobedience, mental torment. Now, David, who later became king, 
you know, after a, a whole lot of things happened. He was very sexual. He was very handsome. He was very wealthy. You know, he he did things that uh, he shouldn't have been doing. But he he was still a man after God's own heart. You know why? Because he did whatever God told him to do. God can deal with messy. He cannot deal with disobedient. So that's why when you look at other people and you say, well, he's still preaching the Bible and stuff, and he did this with a woman, and he did this, and he cheated on his taxes, and he did all of this. Number one, he is not you. So you can't look at somebody else and say, well, I can get away with this because he got away with all of that. Oh, you cannot compare yourself like that. So I shouldn't get punished as much because that person didn't get punished as much and they were worse than me. Stop it. People of God. Oh, you've got to get out of that mentality. This is messing a lot of people up. You have to discipline your flesh. You have to live a disciplined life. You cannot look at other people and tell God, well, you you let him do that, so you're going to have to let me do this too, or let me look over this thing because he did worse. Stop it. How will you know when God has released you to your own devices? How can you tell when God has taken his spirit away from you? You will be able to engage in that thing you like without any conviction. When you do things you know you shouldn't do and you're battling in yourself about it because you're like, ooh, I want to do it, but oh, I know I shouldn't do it. Okay, I'm not going to do it, but ooh, I really want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Ooh, Lord, I really want to do it. When you have that battle, that's conviction. That means you have the Holy Spirit working within you trying to get you past this struggle. But when you are able to go back to that thing and say, oh, feel so good, that means God has released you to that thing you want to do. Oh, you better be afraid. People call this being free and living in their truth. When they give in to their desires, when they just say, God, you just got to forgive me, but I'm going to have to keep doing this. Oh, really? God tried to keep you from evil, but you resisted so much that he had to let you go. How do we know this? Let's look at Luke 12, chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept and in order. This is Jesus talking in a parable. So you have come to Christ. You have given up that thing. Oh, you're in a better place. You are having some victory over that thing. It's no longer bothering you the way that it was. You are swept clean in order. No spirits can harass you in that area of that life. It might have been a porn addiction. Oh, you're over your porn addiction. Okay, you cleaned it out. Well, is that spirit attached to that sin going to leave you alone? No, then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself and they all enter the person and live there and so that person is worse off than before that will be the experience of this evil generation if you have a slip up if you relapse or if you willingly go back to that thing that you have swept clean and gotten some victory over if you give an inch to that that thing is going to come back eight times worse on you than it was before. So if you decide to come back to God, it will feel like a thousand times harder because now all of those demons that are assigned to entice people with that thing you like, that thing you struggle with, all of those are going to be on your back and you have to fight through all of them, at least eight of them, the original one, and then the seven more evil ones to get deliverance. And unfortunately, not everybody survives this process. Think of people who got victory over an addiction for many years. They temporarily relapse and die of an overdose. This is sad and it grieves God tremendously. They relapsed. They just had a little slip up, but that little slip up allowed Satan 
to come in eight times stronger and overtake that person so that they were not able to get themselves back out of that addiction. They were not able to come out of that. It only takes one little slip to make you fall all the way back to square one. People who do not overdose, let's say from a drug addiction, have to go back through all of the steps again to get over that addiction again. Alcoholics Anonymous, if a person relapses, they have to go back through all of the 12 steps all over again. They lose their sobriety pen. They have to start all the way back over. And sometimes a lot of people just give up. They just settle back into their addiction because getting over it a second time is way harder than the first time. This is why we must pray daily for God to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for God to strengthen us and guard us from the evil one. This is one of my favorite verses. I say this every day, every morning, 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. But the Lord is faithful who will strengthen you and keep you from the evil one. God is a keeper, but you have to be willing to follow him and to be completely obedient. It's to save you. This is out of love that you have to crucify your flesh because he knows, God knows what the spiritual laws are. He knows what gives Satan ground in your life. And he's trying to get you to take over ground from Satan so that you can live a victorious life. It's dangerous to allow people to just be themselves and do what they want to do and just embrace your truth. Culture calls this being non-judgmental and embracing everything about a person. Yes, we do love people. But somebody has to tell you in love, like I'm doing right now, that you got to do better. You got to keep following Christ at all costs so that you maintain victory over the enemy. Because once the enemy gets a toehold back into your life, he will create strongholds that are so difficult to break and that can take you out of here. Usually before it's time, a lot of people leave this earth in death before God wanted them to. Think about that. Discipline your flesh. When you discipline your flesh, you make better decisions that keep you out of certain situations that will cause trouble in your life. If we slip, it will be hard, but not impossible to get deliverance and to restore our relationship with God. With God, all things are possible. So we have hope that through Christ, no matter how many times we fall, we will not be utterly destroyed because God is good and wants to save us. It is God's desire for everybody to be saved and to be delivered, for us to believe in his son and follow Christ in word and deed. You just can't hear the word or read the word. You have to be a doer of the word, which means you have to be obedient. But we have to do our part. We have to be willing. We must be willing to crucify our flesh and we must willingly obey the Lord to take up our cross daily and to follow him. If we do this, we are always welcomed into the kingdom of God. And that is the gospel. This is the good news. There is a way out. Christ is the way. There is a way to get victory over this thing you think is overtaking you, over your air quote struggle through the power of the living Christ. You can be free. This is why he came and died for our sins, so that we won't have to continue to struggle, but we have to be obedient and live a disciplined life. All right, hopefully this has made you think. Hopefully you will begin to make some changes in your life. Hopefully this message has blessed you. Find me at mcwwism.com or www.arhampton.com. Thank you for listening and God bless.